You ready? Okay, uh, thank you everybody for coming today. As, uh, as you know, this is a discussion about what the real impact of the proposed tax increases before us in the reconciliation bill are about. We've had two JCT reports, which by the way have erroneously been characterized as Republican reports. The Joint Tax Committee is a bipartisan committee and reports on a bipartisan basis to questions asked by either party. We asked the Joint Tax Committee to give us these kinds of analyses and on their bipartisan basis they did so. The first report that they handed out was one which we asked about where does the impact of these taxes fall. The administration has been very careful to say that, uh, you know, we aren't raising the tax rates of anybody under $400,000, but everybody in America knows that when taxes are charged, some people end up carrying the burden of those taxes. This tells us where that burden falls. That burden comes, by the way, because in the corporate tax field, the impact or the incidence of the corporate tax is passed on to workers, to capital, which means to those who own the stock, people trying to invest for their retirement in a pension plan or a 401k plan, and in price increases to the economy. The report found that in 2023, the very first year, the tax burden would increase by $16.7 billion on Americans making less than $200,000 per year. Another $14.1 billion will be borne by taxpayers earning between $200,000 and $500,000 per year. And during the 10-year period, the average tax burden increases would increase for nearly every income category. And when you get to the point at the end of the 10-year period, the entire burden, half to two-thirds of the entire burden of this new tax revenue would fall on those earning less than $400,000. That's the reality, regardless of the games that are being played in terms of describing what the taxes are on. The second report we asked for was where in our economy do these taxes fall? That was this report which showed that 49.7% of those taxes will fall on manufacturers. And you can see from the chart that it goes across various other aspects of our economy. The point here is this bill will slam manufacturing. And I just point out, and I know my colleagues will get into this in a little more detail, I just point out that we worked as hard as we could back in 2017 to get our tax code amended so that we could incentivize capital formation in America so that we could encourage all those hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars being held offshore to be brought back to the United States and invested here. And what we saw then was it happened. Companies came back to the United States, invested the capital. We got the strongest economy that we have seen in probably all of our lifetimes. Employment was up. Wage increases were up. And the econ and inflation rate was less than 2 percent, down around 1.5 that's what was coming out of the effort to get capital formation back into the United States. This bill is going to slam it. There's one other uh, aspect of this, talking about the manufacturing impact. The National Association of, Man Association of Manufacturers has indicated that because half of the impact of this tax will be on that industry, that this would be a reduction of our gross domestic product by $68.45 billion, a reduction of employment by 218,000 workers, and a reduction of employment income, worker income, of $17 billion. Uh, these numbers show very graphically where the burden of this tax falls, contrary to the arguments that this is just a tax on tax cheats. The bottom line here is that this tax is dangerous for America. With that, I'm going to go on and Senator Toomey, you're next, and then we'll follow him with Senator Portman. Th thank you very much, Senator Crapo. Uh, Senator Crapo, of course, is exactly right. We have an economically destructive tax increase in this proposal combined with price controls that will stifle innovation, all to pay for corporate welfare for green energy and subsidize wealthy people buying Teslas and buying Obamacare. The mechanism by which this becomes a middle-class tax increase is, as Senator Crapo described, 
by virtue of the tax increase on business. And yes, indeed, that will hit manufacturers the hardest. And the reason is because they go after the centerpiece of our 2017 tax reform. One of the most constructive things we did in 2017 was to say that if you are a business and you choose to invest your profits in your business by buying more equipment, buying more machinery, expanding your plant, expanding your capacity, all of which leads to more employment and higher productivity and higher wages, if you do that, will allow you to recognize the expense in the year in which you incur the expense, rather than little bits over many years. What the Democrats are doing in this bill is going back to the little bits over many years. Apparently, the best economy of our lifetime wasn't a very good thing. Apparently, narrowing the wage gap between the high-income and lower-income people wasn't a very good thing. I have yet to hear a Democrat tell us what was wrong with the economy of 2019 that was firing on all cylinders where wages were growing faster than inflation, not the other way around like we have today. And yet they've decided they'll go after the centerpiece of the tax reform that made that possible. They will absolutely devastate American manufacturing and in the process impose this tax increase on people of ordinary and modest means. It's a very bad plan. So the legislation we apparently are going to be asked to vote on this week is called the Inflation Reduction Act. And in fact, it is the Inflation Increase Act. And we've seen here today why that is true. Uh, when you put taxes on the economy that fall to workers <laughs> and fall to consumers and fall to shareholders, it increases inflationary pressures. I'll give you an easy example of this. The tax that we're talking about, and remember this is uh, – 200 and I'm sorry, 326 billion dollars of new taxes. About 30 percent of it is going to fall on consumers. That's based on what the University of Chicago uh, and uh, other analyses have shown. So 30 percent of this is going to flow right down to consumers. Now, when consumers I represent go to the store right now, it's eye popping. <laughs> you know, whether it's food or or whether it's clothing or whether it's uh, buying an electronic, everything costs have gone up dramatically. We're looking at the worst inflation in 40 years. So it's clearly inflationary. But it's even more than that because the burden of this taxation, according to the nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation, but also other analysis that's out there, falls on workers as well. So the very people whose wages are not keeping up with inflation, with inflation at 9 percent and wage growth well below that, People are feeling like they can't get ahead. And if you're on fixed income, it's even worse. But for these folks who work in these companies, and remember, half of this is going to fall on manufacturers, they're going to see their wages and benefits be reduced because of this taxation at a time when they're having a really hard time keeping up with current inflation. So it doesn't help with regard to inflation. I don't know, you know where that uh, name came from, but it's, it's, uh, it's obviously the opposite. Now, there is a group um, called Penn Wharton Economic Studies, and they, they uh, are often cited by the Democrats when, when they think that their work helps them. But they've looked at this thing uh, on an objective basis and said, actually, in the first couple of years, it increases inflation, despite everything that's being said. So this is something that we Republicans are obviously going to block, but I, I hope you'll ask some tough questions, too. How can you call it the Inflation Reduction Act? We just spent uh, a few hundred billion dollars on research and development to help who? Manufacturers. To help ensure that America could be competitive in the global economy. This was the CHIPS Plus legislation that was just passed. So on the one hand, we're saying to manufacturers, we want to help you to become more competitive. On the other hand, we're saying to manufacturers, we're going to take away one of the benefits that encourages investment and economic growth. And by the way, we're not alone in this in this country. All of the other developed countries in the world also offer some kind of bonus depreciation. In fact, of the OECD countries, the top developed countries in the world, uh, we're below the average already. <laughs> we offer less than they do. So this puts us at a competitive disadvantage with countries around the world as well. It's just the wrong thing to do at the wrong time. Here's an alternative. We all recognize inflation is a problem. Let's work together. Let's work together to do what we did at the end of 2019, 2020, when we had unemployment low, when we had inflation incredibly low, 
when we had 3 percent wage growth for 19 straight months, all of which was a well above inflation? Uh, we know how to do that. It's pro-growth policies. It's regulatory relief. It's not increasing taxes. It's having more sensible taxes. It's ensuring that we do increase the supply in this country. We, we know what we have to do. This, unfortunately, goes in the wrong direction. Senator Toomey. I mean, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> Senator Grassley, then Senator Barraza. I'm going to take off on a point that Senator Portman has made pretty strong because it's absolutely the center of this whole thing, and that's the, re the uh, inflation reduction title of their bill because it's definitely an inflation-enhancing bill. Uh, it's going to lead to inflation. You'd think that the Democrats would learn a lesson from what happened when they fed the fires of inflation with two trillion dollars of additional spending back in March of last year. They didn't heed the warning of their own liberal economists, three or four of them that are pretty prominent, of which I remember Larry Summers' name for sure, saying don't do any more and within two months they pass that two trillion dollars. And this is some more of the same. Maybe not quite as large, but still some more of the same. And when you hurt, when you go with inflation, you're hurting blue-collared workers and families on fixed income. They're struggling with these climbing prices that they're getting. Uh, and uh, it just uh, seems to be so inconsistent for one week to pass a bill to bring jobs home through the CHIPS bill and now to uh, pass legislation that's going to harm manufacturing and create unemployment and maybe even drive some manufacturing overseas. It just seems to me these inconsistent policies. And then think of the inconsistency of Democrats always complaining about the wealth and the lack of taxation on the part of the very wealthy and then you're giving big bonuses <laughs> to people that uh, can afford to buy $80,000 cars, uh, which is enhancing uh, the uh, uh, pocketbooks of the one percent that they're complaining about aren't paying their fair share of taxes. So this is not only bad policy, but it's completely inconsistent in so many areas of what the Democrats have said that they want us to accomplish uh, this Congress. Senator Barrasso. Well, you've heard from a number of senators about the concerns of the American people and its inflation. When you take a look at Joe Biden's poll numbers, which are at an all-time historic low, you say, why is it? And it's because we are at a 40-year high of inflation. People feel they can't keep up. They feel they're falling further and further behind. And now we see this legislation by the Democrats that is going to make the burden harder on American families who are just worried about being able to afford a full tank of gas and worried about when they go to the grocery store and try to make a, buy a full week's worth of groceries to be able to pay for the groceries. And yet the Democrats are talking about massive taxing and spending. I mean, these are the things you would never do with this kind of inflation and stagnation, the recession that we're in. I know Biden says, oh, we're not in a recession, but just Google the definition of a recession. We're in it. Two-thirds of the American people say we're in a recession. And then they want, they want to do this kind of massive spending when we know it's massive spending that got us into this inflationary problem in the past. They have a 725-page bill, and it spends about a, over a billion dollars a page. So we know that Joe Biden likes to redefine things when things don't go so well for him. He's redefined border security because we don't have a secure border. He's redefined uh, success in Afghanistan. Now he wants to redefine recession. People aren't buying it. They watch him on television. They say, they don't believe that he and the Democrats are up to solving the problems that face them every day. And when you look at this, you know they're heading in the wrong direction. To me, I look at this and say, this is going to take us to double-digit inflation if the Democrats are able to cobble together the votes to force this down the throats of the American people. And we haven't even talked about the fact that in this bill is legislation to hire 86,000 more IRS agents, to supersize, put the IRS on on steroids. I mean, the funding of this, what, $86 billion, do the math, it's a million dollars per IRS agent. You don't need that many IRS agents to go after a few people that they say are very, very rich. 
This is coming after the families and the farmers and the small businesses of America. That's who's going to bear the burden of this legislation. And it ignores the main concerns of the American people, which is the crisis at the border, crushing inflation uh, that people are living with, as well as crime in the cities. That's why two-thirds of the American people say this administration and the Democrats are focused on the wrong things. We ought to be doing things to lower inflation and lower the impact on American families. This is not it. Senator Thune? Well, one of the things that the um, Democrats have tried to claim is that their reckless tax and spending spree doesn't raise taxes. That is unequivocally false. In fact, it raises taxes by hundreds of billions of dollars, including over $300 billion in a brand new tax hike on American businesses, uh, nearly half of which has been pointed out is going to be paid by uh, American manufacturers, making it harder for them to produce goods in America. We are in a recession right now. Increased taxes on the people who create jobs means you're going to have less growth, fewer jobs, and lower wages. That's a result of raising taxes, especially in the middle of a recession. And according to an analysis, as uh, has perhaps already been mentioned by the National Association of Manufacturers, in 2023 alone, the Democrats' bill uh, would reduce the real gross domestic product by over $68 billion and cost our economy over 200,000 jobs. Now, there are th those who claim that these aren't tax hikes are saying that this is just closing loopholes. Well, I don't know <laughs> how you can find $300 billion by just closing loopholes. Um, what Republicans wrote in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, was provisions in there that deliberately allowed, as has been pointed out, um, businesses to write off investments that they make and put back into their businesses for the same year in, that they incurred those costs. Uh, there are a couple of uh, goals in the 2017 Tax Act. One was lower the rates and one was to allow for faster cost recovery. And what we saw from that was record growth, record low unemployment, and higher wages, particularly for those in lower income categories. The Democrats' bill threatens to undo uh, all of that, and the effect isn't going to be limited just to businesses. As the Joint Economic Committee has pointed out, uh, a big burden of this uh, massive uh, reckless tax and spending spree is going to be felt by people who make less than $200,000 a year. In fact, in 2023 alone, about $17 billion of that burden is going to be experienced by people in that income category. And as has been mentioned also, the uh, Democrats' bill does uh, increase in a significant way um, funding for the IRS. Eighty billion dollars in new funding for, uh, I saw 87,000, uh, Senator Barrasso said 86,000 new employees, but you know, 86,000, 87,000, I mean, think about that, literally doubles the size uh, of the IRS. Why? Not to improve taxpayer service. Only 4% of the money goes to improving taxpayer service. This goes to allowing the IRS to harass uh, businesses across this country. <clears throat> and also uh, proven by the analysis that's been done, it's disproportionately hard on people who are going to make and businesses who are making under $400,000 a year. It's never a good time to raise taxes. Um, but I would hope that even the Democrats would recognize what a terrible time it is uh, to raise taxes right now when the American people are already seeing 40-year record high inflation and um, already seeing, they're going to say, $9,000 in increased costs for the same basic necessities that they bought and paid for this year as a result of that inflation. And what the Democrats want to do is add to it. Thank you. Next, we'll have Senator Lankford and Senator Young. But before I ask Senator Lankford to come up, we do have some charts on the IRS, too. I didn't put those up, but when they're done, we'll put those charts up, go over them very briefly, and then throw it open for questions. Well, this is a bill called the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, and it's being laid out there as it's going to reduce infl uh, inflation uh, and it's going to reduce the deficit. 
except when it was actually studied and scored, it doesn't reduce inflation. It doesn't reduce the deficit. But they're pressing on with it anyway and just continue to be able to say it over and over again. What does it do? Well, it does decrease manufacturing in the United States. At the exact moment when we have a supply chain issue, when we're having more and more challenges with our manufacturing and when we're trying to incentivize more manufacturing to the United States, they're raising taxes on manufacturing in the United States. So it doesn't lower inflation. It doesn't lower the deficit. It does punish manufacturing, unless, by the way, you're doing green energy. If you're doing green energy, you're protected. But if you're producing nails, if you're producing bolts, if you're producing baby formula, if you're producing car parts, if you're producing lumber, your taxes are all going to go up. If anyone believes that all the prices of all those things because their taxes go up is not going to actually impact the consumer, you're not looking at basic economics. Basic economics says when you tax something more, the price of it's going to go up. They're taxing manufacturing, especially American manufacturing, more. The prices will go up, which will increase inflation. That's basic. So what are they doing to be able to reduce inflation in this bill? As I've already mentioned, they're raising taxes on manufacturing. They're reducing inflation by hiring thousands of new IRS agents so they can do audits. And by the way, there are no limits to the audits. They continue to talk about where well, they're going to go after wealthy taxpayers, but if you actually read the bill, there are no limits for the audits. They can do any audit of any individual, of any small business, of any farmer that they want to be able to do. They spend 10 times as much doing audits as they do on trying to do taxpayer <laughs> services. So people in my state are calling me and saying, I'm waiting on hold for, with the IRS for hours to days. I have individuals that have called me and said, I've been working through a case with the IRS for years now and can't get an answer. But they spend 10 times as much money doing new audits as they do actually helping with taxpayer services. What else do they do to try to lower inflation? Well, they have a new tax and fee and new royalties uh, that are on oil and gas production in the United States. So while gasoline prices are high, they actually add another fee on that to be able to rise the price of gasoline again. They've studied the area on just on natural gas, which people in my state use to heat their homes, heat the water, uh, to be able to do electricity generation. The natural gas folks have looked at the, the features of that and said the price of natural gas will go up 17 percent, 17 percent, just on the actions of this bill. So while they say this is about taking out inflation, it's actually going to raise the price of everything. And oh, by the way, they have a prescription drug piece in it as well that's not getting much attention right now. But literally in the prescription drug piece, they're going after savings in Medicare, which the savings from Medicare they're going after, they're then taking that money from the savings of Medicare and applying it over into the Affordable Care Act to do a new set of subsidies. They are literally taking a program that is set to go into default in 2028, taking money from that program that will go insolvent in 2028 and moving it over to another age bracket. If I can say it bluntly, this bill takes money from 76-year-olds and moves it to 26-year-olds to be able to subsidize their health care instead. People need to ask real questions about this quote-unquote Inflation Reduction Act. When it doesn't reduce inflation, and it does increase prices, and it doesn't lower the deficit, we should ask why this is even moving forward at all. Senator Young. Here we go again. I guess the National Democratic Party has given up on the industrial Midwest, the heartland. They've just given up. You know, it, was, it was a year ago next week that Democrats attempted to push through a $3.5 trillion tax and spend boondoggle. We won the argument and we won the day. But here we are making the same arguments. My hope is that in the end we'll be victorious, but uh, I, I don't believe the Democrats are doing this for political reasons. Because I tell you, this is really bad politics back where I live. We have the, the worst inflation, and in, in certainly in memory. And they're trying to revive this massive tax and spending initiative. So listen, let's look at the latest iteration of, of that legislation, which they have 
uh, in a nod to George Orwell, dubbed the Inflation Protection, Inflation Control, whatever it is, Act. It does nothing of the sort. This bill would raise taxes on nearly every in income bracket in America. It would increase taxes on those Americans who make less than $10,000 a year. I represent a lot of those Americans. Now, the Democrats have, have for generations now styled themselves as defenders of the working man, guardians, people of modest means. This is so ill-advised. This is, frankly, this is punitive to the least among us in this country. And it's more than that. The median household income in the state of Indiana is $58,000. Under this plan, families in that income range in my state will see their taxes increase by $2 billion next year alone. I'm here for those families. I'm speaking on behalf of those families. They're, they're upset. They find this absolutely absurd. We are the most manufacturing intensive state in the country. As we've already heard, this legislation will slam our manufacturers. This is an anti-Indiana bill. Anti-Indiana. We just passed a really important piece of competitiveness legislation to ensure that we can outgrow, out-innovate, and out-compete the Chinese Communist Party. We do that with one hand, and in the other hand, we have a Democrat-led Senate and House and, and White House advancing an initiative that will, in fairly short order, undermine our national competitiveness. I offered an amendment to last year's bill. The not one penny in taxes raised amendment. And, and uh, the objective here was to ensure that we got everyone on record and ensured that everyone was going to register formally in the light of day their, their views about whether or not we should increase taxes on Americans, those who make $400,000 or less per year. President Biden and Kamala Harris over the course of the campaign, on 60 different occasions, promised there would be no increase in tax burden for Americans who, who make $400,000 a year or less. Well, folks, Democrats are trying to ram through legislation this week that puts a $16.7 billion tax burden on that same cohort, cohort of Americans. So here we are again. Uh, we will continue to... Uh, argue against. We will fight against this ill-advised public policy. Uh, we can only hope that this year's bill suffers the same fate as last year's. Thank you. And as I said, before we open it up for questions, I'll put up the IRS chart. Several of my colleagues have indicated that this bill also includes that $80 billion uh, appropriation for the IRS. And uh, this, just, this first chart just shows 40 to 57 percent of that impact from the audits would, would occur with regard to people who make $50,000 or less. 65 to 78 percent on those making less than 100,000 and 78 to 90 percent on those making less than 200,000. And the bottom line is the key one here. Only about 4 to 9 percent of the expected audits could come from those making $500,000 or more. Now, why is that? By the way, this is another request of the Joint Tax Committee to tell us where the tax gap lies. The, the Democrats consistently say, well, the taxes we're imposing here are on tax cheaters and people who aren't paying their fair share of taxes. So we asked the Joint Tax Committee to tell us where is this tax gap. And could you, there's another chart under here. The Joint Tax Committee pointed out, we don't have that chart. <laughs> Well, I guess we don't have it. The Dem they pointed out that of the tax gap, only 4 to 9 percent of it is in those who make over $500,000. Is, is that it? Well, yeah, this, this is basically it. The tax gap lies in these categories. And, and what I'm saying again is the Joint Tax Committee has identified in which income cohorts there are expected 
uh, payments of taxes that are less than those due. And if you've got 87,000 auditors coming on board, by the way, that is six times the annual budget of the IRS, 87,000 auditors coming on board, only 4 to 9% of that tax gap is in those making more than $500,000. They must have to go in their audits after those in the lower income categories. That's what this chart shows. And that's what my colleagues are complaining about. With that, let's throw it open for questions, and please, colleagues, step up here and help answer them. We'll go here, and then there, and then here, and then here. And not even get over here, so you'll get yours. Well, of course, we are making this case that we've made here to you today as aggressively as we can. Would you like to elaborate on that, anybody? I, I think that's, that's the answer. And we're making it not just to Senator Sinema. We're making it to every single senator and, frankly, to every single American. Yes. Oh, oh I said I'd go back there first. I can, only, I can only respond. I have not had a conversation with her about that. I, I can only say that I am aware that she has expressed opposition to it, and so I would expect that she would be supportive of efforts to, to uh, take that out of the bill. I, I don't have any other information beyond that. Yes? I thought my questions were a lot about Senator Sinema, but um, <laughs> I'll leave that. But um, can you talk about the ways that you will attempt to unwind this in reconciliation? Are you picking off individual provisions? I mean, how difficult yeah. will you make this? What we will do is bring – I'm not going to give specifics because that actually hasn't been decided yet, but we will be bringing uh, ob bird objections to many pieces of the various uh, objectionable portions, and we will be bringing targeted amendments and as well as broad amendments to either re commit the – back to the committee to fix the bill or to change text in the bill, depending on how the budget rules will allow those amendments to be developed. And you can assume that it will be on everything that we've talked about today. Let's see. Where did I say? I said I would go here and then over here. <laughs> You know, I haven't seen the details of those. I know they've been sending out names of people who support it. We always see that. There are always, each side, you know, lines up their supporters. But I, I don't know, do any of you have a better response to that? I don't know exactly what their, their case is. I do know that, for. what, pardon? Depends on who they're working for. Yeah, it depends on who they work for. But I also know that one of the arguments that I've heard is that, well, we are going to be providing Americans uh, as much money uh, in our, spending part of the bill as we are in the tax impacts on them, and so this isn't really a tax increase. Uh, to me, that just means they're admitting that it's a tax and spend bill. It doesn't really re address uh, correctly the question of, of whether this is a tax bill and what the consequences of it are, but I, I can't speak specifically to those, those, uh, those positions that are being taken. Yes? I can't comment on how they, uh, the bird objections will turn out, but I can say that uh, we don't have a specific time yet as to when the uh, meetings will be held with the parliamentarian. What happens is meetings are held between both sides at the same time with the parliamentarian and the objections are discussed. Um, we're hoping that we could have some of those meetings tomorrow. Uh, some have been going on on different parts of the title, but not on these parts. And I don't know when those will come, but we're hoping soon. Sure. Um, uh, as you have had the discussion, well, I have not specifically had those conversations, and so no, I I have not, and I don't know that anybody who has is is going to discuss 
publicly what you know what their conversations were. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I can just say that's under consideration. As you might guess, there are about 100 or more amendments that are under consideration. Uh, and uh, I don't know which ones will ultimately come, but that's definitely one that's under consideration. Yes, here and then here. So two questions. One, are you confident that you can convince some of the <laughs> No, I don't, I'm not going to, you know, I, we're getting a lot of questions about Senator Sinema. I'm not going to tell you what she thinks, I, you know, and, and I don't know what she thinks. We are making our case is, is the best I can say. Yeah, I would consider that, but that doesn't mean that that's what will be decided that we will do. There's a, there are many ways you could approach it. You could exempt a certain category, but that would seem to be a little bit discriminatory. Uh, you could also uh, ex exempt or, or allow the consideration of the deductions and tax credits that are in the tax code to be utilized in this new book tax that is being created by the Democrats and help to create that same balance. And there are many other ways that this could be approached. And definitely, I would consider amendments to try to accomplish that objective. Things like cost recovery and post Yeah, yes. OK, yes. Good. I wish one of you guys would answer one of these mansion and cinema questions. Thank you. Um, so what you're saying, though, is that this legislation is about the And it's also about upholding the goals of the people. Why do you think we need to reinvent the wheel for why we need to change the goals of the people of the United States? I can't speak for him, nor will I try to. Uh, but I will respond to the question about those two issues. Uh, one, that it's not raising taxes on certain Americans. Technically, it's not raising their tax rates. It is raising taxes, and they are paying them in, in terms of they will be the ones who, who incur the burden of these taxes. So we could get into, you know, arguments over technicalities and language here. And if what the president meant when he said, I won't raise taxes, on anybody who earns under $400,000 meant, well, I, I won't raise taxes that you will have to end up bearing, but I won't raise your actual tax rate, then we can get into those you know, technical arguments. The fact is, the reality is that he is proposing, and they are proposing taxes that do just what we talked about today. And those who will bear that burden, those who will, quote, pay those taxes, are the ones we've described here with these reports. And I don't think, I, you know, this is the joint tax reports. There are other reports that do the same thing. Yeah, Rob? So I, I just can't help myself. Um, <laughs> I, I won't address directly your question about Senator Manchin, but I will say this is not a loophole. I mean, I mentioned earlier that every developed country in the world helps to encourage their manufacturers to make more investments. And we just passed legislation to do that in ways we have never done before. And here we are, less than a week later, saying, well, you know what? We've changed our minds. <laughs> We're going to say to manufacturers, a number of them who are, you know, larger companies, they employ millions of Americans, by the way, and provide millions of products, you know, have millions of consumers and provide products to all of us. We're going to say to these folks, you know, you somehow are the kind of manufacturers that we, we don't want to help. Bonus depreciation is not a loophole. It's a considered policy of the United States Congress, the House and the Senate, to try to encourage us to have more investment in America, therefore more economic growth and more jobs. And again, we're not even uh, at the halfway point in terms of what other countries do. You know, the UK does a lot more than we do. And when manufacturers are trying to decide where they're going to put their next plant, they look at this. And I really believe when you look back at what happened in 2017, Perhaps the most effective thing that was done, and remember, it lowered the rates for businesses, but it said to businesses, if you come here and invest, you can get an immediate write-off. So expensive equipment, let's say that might go into a fab to make semiconductors. I mean, is, isn't that something we want to encourage? 
So it's not a loophole. It's, it's, a, it's a tax policy. If we were responsible, what we would do is not set up a whole other system of taxation, the so-called book tax, which is a new calculation that no one's ever seen before because it's, it's even a change from the traditional book tax. We would instead go into the tax code and say, well, this tax preference isn't good. This one is. And actually do the hard work of legislating, but not to say that we're going to just decide that we're going to establish a new book tax that says you can't take bonus depreciation as an example. By the way, there are other parts of our tax code that are also affected. Uh, you guys know what an ESOP is, employee owns plan. It's an employee owned company, employee stock ownership plan. Um, you know that people use what are called um, ESOPs to encourage more participa participation from workers in the company. Um, they're affected by this as well because they lose a lot of their tax preferences under this book tax. So they're telling us that they're very worried that it's going to discourage new ESOPs and cause some existing e e ESOPs no longer to be effective. And so, you know, we should like ESOPs, which are good things. Democrats typically do too. Stock options. A lot of tech companies use stock options. They're also affected by this. But the manufacturing piece is the biggest piece, and that's because so many manufacturers use this bonus depreciation. But it's not just limited to them. It's energy companies as well. So in 1986, Congress, in its wisdom, decided to do this, to set up a new book tax. It was part of the 86 Tax Act. It lasted about two and a half years, and it was repealed. Why? Because it's incredibly complicated, because it's unfair, uh, because as the AICPA told us in their letter last week, this is the CPAs who would benefit from complexity. You know, it doesn't make sense to have two different tax systems and punish some businesses, therefore some workers, therefore some consumers, and not others. So we actually can learn from history here. We tried this before. <laughs> it didn't work. It was ended. It was, re it was repealed because it makes no sense. That's what is going on here. I know it's complicated and you get into all these tax issues, but basically what it says is we're going to set up another system of taxation that takes away some of the benefits that Congress traditionally wants to provide. Why does that make sense? It's always bad policy, but it's terrible policy when we're looking at 40-year high inflation and the second quarter of negative economic growth. On the IRS chart, put that up for a second again if you would, guys. Um, this is one, as you may know, I've worked on a lot. I was back in the 90s, uh, the co-chair of the IRS commission. I'm actually someone who believes we should put more funding into the IRS. You know where we should put it? Into technology, because they're way behind. And my constituents are affected by that, because they can't get answers, because they can't get someone to answer the phone, because they, they can't deal with our tax administration system, because we are so antiquated. And we work in silos, and we don't have the latest technology. All this money going to the IRS, you would think it would go toward technology first, taxpayer service second, which are related. Six and a half percent of it goes to technology. There's a chart on that. Six and a half percent of it. Four percent of it goes to taxpayer service. Um, what it's doing is it's doubling the size of the IRS in terms of people who will be auditing the people I represent. And we talked earlier about how that's going to affect small businesses, farmers, ranchers, and so on. So even in this area where I would normally say, okay, helping the IRS to be more effective, that's not a bad thing because small businesses in Ohio are negatively impacted right now by the IRS's lack of ability to be effective in dealing with them and giving them answers to their questions. But that's not even part of this. So there's there are plenty of targets of opportunity here for us to try to stop or improve this legislation. And in response to your questions earlier, uh, we have a responsibility to do that. We're going to have to run. We're 15 minutes late for a caucus meeting. So thank you all very much.